tonight? Never been on yet? Never been to one of these yet? Just curious. Lots of repeats. All right, well, let's share the screen. Oops, I have to let me share the screen, Lance. Can you let me share the screen? Yeah. Um, there you go. Should be able to now. Okay, here we go. All right, now can you hear me? Should be able to. Yep. Very good answer. Okay. All right. So, all right. Tonight we're going to look at mustards. Maybe not one of your most favorite groups of plants, but nonetheless, this is a group that are pretty common, pretty important. Uh, we'll talk a little bit why in just a little bit. We've got um, some purple rocket here on the left and a pepper grass there on the right. Mustards are, are pretty commonly found, especially in rural types of environments, habitats. They're often, you know, one of the, some of the first plants to flower and get going in the spring. So yeah, there's many, many good reasons why we should probably you know, learn to pay a little more attention to, to them as a group. They are pretty diverse. Uh, in terms of uh, globally, there's about 340 genera globally and 3,780 species roughly. In North America, uh, the, there's about 100 genera and about 740 species. If you look at the number of non-native species in North America, the uh, non-native species account for about 15% of the species of mustards. Um, remember that number, 15%. Well, we're going to take a look at how that stacks up in Iowa in just a little bit. All right, so let's, as we usually do, is, is we kind of go through a little bit of a refresher on some basic um, characteristics of the family. So we're going to start with that, look at some slides that help us sort of characterize uh, you can recognize the family, and it, and it turns out this family is easy to recognize. So again, it's one of these families that it's pretty easy to say, yep, that's a mustard. But then it gets a little bit harder when you have to try to determine which species of mustard it might be. Uh, a couple of the reasons for that difficulty in the, in the family is that there is quite a bit of variation in leaf morphology. Most of these plants will have basal leaves and then uh, colleen or leaves that are up on the stem. And there'll be quite a bit of variation, or it can be at least quite a bit of variation uh, in those leaves from the base of the plant up, up into the stem. Uh, then there's also uh, the difficulty in that uh, there's usually a need for fruits. Uh, there are keys that will key out mustards just based on flowering material, but as I found, most of those eventually make a reference to the fruits. So uh, you usually need to have fruits present. Luckily in the mustards, what often happens is that they will remain in flower for quite a long time. You'll have uh, an individual plant can have fruits at the lower part of the in inflorescence and still have some flowers uh, open and, and, and you, for use, uh, able to look at up on the upper part of the plant. All right, here's a little diagram that uh, highlights many of the characteristics of uh, mustards. So let me um, advance the slide here. It seems like it always wants to stick. There we go. So the most obvious thing is the flower. And this is a little um, flower diagram or floral diagram as we call them down here. Uh, this outer ring are the sepals, so there's four sepals. Then this inner ring here are the petals, so there's four petals. And then these little lollipop tops here, little circles, are the anthers of the stamens. And most of the species of mustards have six stamens, but they're arranged in two different ways. There's sort of two groups. There's there's four of them that are taller, and they are more to the inner part of the flower, and there's two that are shorter. 
Uh, the term for that is tetradenomus, as we'll see that in just a little bit. The female part of the flower, the pistillate uh, portion of the flower right here, this is what is shown right here, has a pistil that's formed from two carpels. So that's why we see kind of two, two things here side by side. Each of those is a carpel. And then these little ovules uh, that we see there in the center, those will become seeds. Most of the time, the inflorescence is some type of raceme, which again means that, um, well, there's an example of a raceme there, and there's an example of a raceme. These, these are the flowers here, these are the fruits over here. But a raceme again is, is simply the flowers are attached directly to the stem, the inflorescence uh, axis here by a little short or sometimes a little bit longer pedicel. Uh, that's the a pedicel is the term for the, the, the stem of, of a flower. So mostly always racemes. Now there are two kinds of fruits. And as I said, fruits are gonna be important. The fruits and mustards are basically a type of capsule, a specialized type of capsule. A capsule is a type of a dry fruit that splits open on its own, allows the seeds to fall out. Uh, one type of capsule or specialized capsule is called a silicone, and the other type is called a silic. So we've got two silicones here, we've got a silic down here. Here we've got um, another silic right here. And the difference between them is just their, their length to width ratio, basically. If the length to width ratio is less than three, uh, that means it's a silicone. So silicones are relatively short and somewhat broad. If the length to width ratio is greater than three, then it's a silic. So silics are generally long and slender. Here's another uh, nice diagram with again, some of those examples of the silicones and the silics there, as you can see. There's that term again for the arrangement of the andresium, the, the stamens, four tall stamens, two short stamens. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. Lepidiums, for example, the pepper grasses uh, just have two stamens, but, and there are some that just have four, all equal height. So basically there's a situation where you have just two or four, but most of the time it's six. And again, is looks like this. The petals uh, are arranged in a sort of a cross. That's uh, where the old name of the Brassicaceae, the Cruciferae, uh, cross shape uh, comes from. All right, let's look at the flowers a little bit more. So here again, uh, here's a nice diagram, a nice, nice picture, I should say, of a, of a flower, a must, typical mustard flower. Uh, it's complete and perfect. That just means that when we say complete, it's got all of the four main flower parts. It's got sepals, it's got petals, it's got stamens, and it's got carpels, which are fused together to make the pistil. It's perfect. That means, again, it's just it's got both sexes. So it's got both the male and female parts of a flower present. It's got stamens and a pistil. It's uh, actinomorphic, which means that the perianth, which refers to the petals, and the sepals are down here underneath, can't see the sepals very well, but the sepals and the petals both have a radial symmetry to them. The perianth is distinct. That means, of course, that the sepals are not fused to one another. The petals are not fused to one another. Uh, there's no fusion occurring in, in any of the sepals or, or petals. In fact, the petals, as it says here, often have a claw. And what's meant by a claw is shown right here in this diagram. A claw is when the petal is um, pretty well differentiated into a very narrow, almost like a, a stem, you might say. Uh, so the claw is this lower part here. And the get my laser pointer here, and the blade part or the petal part more like more like a blade. So again, remember a, a petal is a modified leaf. 
And so uh, what a petal with a claw looks like, it just looks a little bit more like a leaf, which is again, what it came from, where you've got a blade and a petiole. The ovary is superior. Um, placentation is parietal, and there's this thing called a replum. Well, in this um, lower diagram down here, we can see the ovary right here is in this uh, pink area right here. That's the ovary. And this is most of the time it is fairly elongate. Uh, the ovary occupies uh, a large part of the pistil. The style is usually very short in mustards. This black little uh, double arrow is the style. And then the stigma is that broader uh, area on, on top of the, the style there. So again, what's, what's, we have to understand again what's happening here in this thing called the replum because that is a characteristic that, that is unique to, to mustards. So again, here is another floral diagram shown over here. I um, colored some things here again so we can see the, the sepals are green, the petals are yellow, the uh, stamens are, are in white here. Again, four tall, two short. And this is the ovary again with the two carpels that are fused together, but they're fused together uh, in, um, when the, in the sense in the way the carpal was opened up and fused in kind of an open position for the carpels so that normally when that happens, there's just one single chamber, one locule inside the ovary. But that's not what we see when we look at mustards. What we see is that there is a septum or a division that goes across this and, and does form two separate locules. But this is not a true septum. It's called a false septum because a true septum, let me jump ahead to this slide here uh, real quick. Uh, this is a diagram that shows um, how ovaries uh, form when carpels come together. Here's a single carpel. Here's an ovary that's formed by two carpels fusing together, like Let we have in the mustards. But in this case, the carpels fuse together when the carpels are closed. And so a wall of each of these carpels, they fuse together along this common wall, and that becomes the septum then of the ovary which makes the two chambers or two locules. This is a septum. What happens in the mustards is this, these carpels again fuse together, but they fuse together in an open position so that now there's not a true septum. Instead, this, and this dash, dash line is just meant to show that this is one carpel here and one carpel here. What happens again in the mustards is that the placental tissue uh, which is the red circles right here, the placental tissue uh, grows out and extends and goes across here to form this thing that we have to call now a false septum. It is not, it's not formed the, the way that a real septum is formed. And that's the term, the, the term replum then refers to both this, this membranous, it's gonna be real of a, a real membranous type of tissue. But it's a membranous partition that divides the ovary into two, com two compartments. Uh, you'll see it on the fruits. It remains on the fruits. What will happen is the, um, the wall of the fruit, the pericarp here will fall away. Uh, here, here's an actual picture of one here again. So here is one carpal. Here's another carpal. Again, here is the replum going across here. Uh, again, extensions from the placental tissue right here and right here going across here. And we'll use the term valve to refer to this part of the, of the fruit, which is simply just the, the wall of the fruit or what's called the pericarp of the fruit. The valves uh, dis, disengage from the fruit, detach from the fruit, and that's how the fruits open up to release the seeds. So there's going to be two locules inside, again, separated by this thin membranous tissue called a replum. Here's the diagram, or I should say some pictures that show what this looks like here. So here is a valve, one of the walls of, of one of the carpels as it has detached. 
Here's the valve from the other side detaching. And here, this membranous tissue right here, this membranous partition, that's the replum, or in other words, again, the false septum. And then here are the seeds. They're still attached to the, the rim of this uh, replum, which is usually a thicker strand of, 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 of tissue, a little bit thicker. That's the portion of the placenta that the alveoles are attached to. Okay, so we look at Iowa brassicaceae. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the lifespans here because um, a lot of the brassicaceae are annuals and biannuals. But in the brassicaceae, there's actually two types of annuals. And um, many of them, I would say probably the majority of them that are annuals, I don't know for sure exactly if there are any summer annuals, but from what I've seen, uh, most of the annuals are winter an annuals. So we've got two uh, diagrams here that show the difference between these two. So in a winter annual, you know, of course, an annual, of course, means that uh, it means that the plant has a lifespan that ends within one year of germination. It doesn't live a full year. It, the lifespan of the plant ends uh, before the first year after germination ends. And again, what we're very familiar with, of course, are the summer annuals, which germinate in the spring, begin growing, they produce flowers and produce uh, seeds late in the summer, midsummer, late summer, disperse those seeds, and then die by the time fall comes. In a winter annual up here, germination occurs in the fall. These seeds germinate in the fall. The plant will grow into a small rosette plant with just basal leaves that overwinters. And then because of that, it sort of got a head start on other plants in the spring. As soon as uh, spring temperatures warm up, like, like right now, uh, getting some warm days, uh, those rosettes start to uh, come back to life and start to begin growth. And now they'll produce a comb and they'll flower and produce seed in the springtime now. So I would say late spring, early summer, they're producing uh, flowers and seeds. And then of course, disperse those seeds and die shortly thereafter as an annual does. Uh, then these seeds then are dormant over the summertime uh, and will have to break dormancy by some, some method again of exposure to summer heat so that they can germinate in the fall. Whereas of course, summer annuals, their seeds are dormant over the winter. There's quite a few biannuals as well, and there's a few perennials. This little table here shows the breakdown for the mustards uh, identified by Eilers and Rosa. Eilers and Rosa, as you should remember, is the checklist of vascular plants for Iowa. It's the only uh, you know, published volume that we really have that does that provides that, that list, sort of an, an official list. And if you look at the lifespans, and, and this means annual, this means annual or biannual, this means annual or perennial, sometimes a short-lived perennial. If you look at the annuals, here's how they break down in terms of the native ones, the non-native ones. If you look at the total number of, of at least those that can behave like an annual, there's 42, 61% of, of them. Biannuals or biannual, biannuals or biannual perennials, short-lived perennials. Uh, so they break down for native and non-native, total of 14, and then the perennials. What I want to draw attention to is you look at the native versus non-native columns, we see that um, at least for Iowa, there's far more, almost twice as many non-native species as native. Non-native species have a percentage of 62% which is way, way over the 15% of non-native species in the flora of North America. So that tells you that we really have a lot, uh, way more than what would be expected just on the basis of, of the North America percentage. We really have a lot of non-native mustards, weedy species. All right, let's see. So I'm gonna show you now our five important characteristics that uh, if you're gonna work with mustards and use some keys, you're gonna need to, these are, these are key traits. These are things that are gonna come up over and over again. 
And the first one is this idea again of the fruit. And that's why you, you almost always need to have fruits, whether the fruits are silicone or whether it's a silic. Now, that's not really very hard. So that's a real simple thing to tell. You can, you can actually measure the length and width if you have to, if you're not quite sure, measure the length and the width and then take the length divided by the width. And that's the length to width ratio. That's what we're talking about right here. That's what this three X is. All right, the second character that's important here often is how the seeds are arranged in the uh, fruits. Uh, you no, know, a seed is a mature ovule. That's what this is referring to here. And when an ovule becomes mature, that's when we have a seed. That, that's what an ovule becomes, is, is a seed. And so again, we have these locules. There's, there's, you know, there's two locules, one on each side of the replum. And you have the situation where there's either one row of seeds, and that's usually again a situation when the when the uh, fruit, typically a silic, is very narrow. So there's really only room for just one row of seeds versus two rows of seeds, as we see here in uh, Draba. So that's another fairly easy thing to see. You need, you need to have the fruits, of course. You need to be able to open up those, those uh, silicos or silics, and that's easy to do if they haven't opened up yet. Okay, then the shape of the fruit is the next characteristic. And, and even just looking at the shape of the fruit and saying whether the fruit is more circular in cross section or maybe uh, quadrangular, which means sort of four angled, a little bit squarish, or whether the fruit is flat. Those are your first two options, whether it's again, more circular or more three-dimensional in a sense is a way of thinking that or whether it's flattened and more two-dimensional. And then if it's flattened, ah, if it's flattened, then this is what this refers to. How is it flattened? Is it flattened parallel to the replum or is it flattened perpendicular to the replum? That's a fairly easy thing to tell too. In this fruit right here, the edges of the replum or the margins of the replum are those pink lines. And so the, in this case, this is flattened parallel to the replum. The replum is the same width as the fruit. We can't see the replum here because the, the uh, fruit walls are still present here. But if we were to pull these fruit walls away and we could see the replum, the replum would go all the way across here. So the, again, the replum is parallel. The fruit is, is flattened parallel with the replum. And this one over here, the replum is this ridge that we see on the, on the face of the fruit right here. That's, that's the margin of the replum, the edge of the replum. So that means again, that we're looking at the edge of the replum, the replum is going through this fruit. So it's, it's flattened perpendicular. The fruit is flattened this way, but the replum is going into the screen coming out at us. So it's, it's, it's flattened perpendicular. This situation is almost always going to be um, shown again because there'll be some type of a ridge or evidence of the replum going across the face of the fruit, the broad face of the fruit. You don't see any kind of ridge going across the face here. We see this ridge going across this face right here. And almost always going to show that, that ridge or that characteristic is always, almost always going to be in silicles. So this situation is almost always in silicles, this, this type of fruit here. Then uh, vegetative character, how the upper leaves, and again, we usually look at the upper or at least mid to upper level calling leaves when we want to make comparisons, because again, the variation in leaves is substantial from the base of the plant. Those basal leaves look different than the leaves further up the stem. So are the mid to upper leaves on the stem, are they auriculate and clasping or not? So this means there's uh, um, some diagrams in the glossary that you have in a handout, but auriculate means they have little lobes, ear-like lobes that uh, extend off the base of the leaf. Um, this is the bottom of the leaf here. And quite often those little lobes sort of wrap around or at least to some extent clasp the, the stem. So this is auriculate and clasping here. And this one is 
Well, this is the leaf right here. I wanted to focus really right where the leaf is attached. So you can't see much of the leaf, but this is a part of the leaf. So this is the base of the leaf. This one is, is just uh, got a, a petiole here that's attaching the leaf right to the, the stem here. Uh, and this one here, Raripa, um, this is the leaf right here and it's, it's attached, attached by the base. Again, so this is a, this is a sessile leaf, there's no petiole, but there's no, neither one of these have any kind of oracle. So any kind of um, lobing that's, that's clasping the, the stem. All right, then finally, uh, this last characteristic here, five, is the pubescence types. Uh, most mustards have some pubescence somewhere on the plant. And a lot of the keys will ask you to look and see, is the pubescence mostly of, of one type? Are the hairs mostly simple or are there two types? Here's a little diagram I found that shows, um, this is what's meant by simple hairs. Just a, a simple, just, you know, linear little hair-like structure here. Now hairs can be um, complex in other different ways. There can be hairs that are called dendritic hairs that look like little trees because the hairs have branches on them. And there can be uh, hairs that are sort of star-shaped, stellate hairs. Um, but, and stellate hairs do occur in the, in the mustards, but most of the time in the mustards, the hairs are simply one of these two types. Either the hairs are simple like this, and here's a, a photo micrograph of a simple hair, or they are two branched. And so what I mean by two branched is it looks like this. The hair um, may or may not have a stalk. Here, this one is uh, pretty much sessile. This one has a short stalk, but then there are essentially two branches that come off the top of that hair. They kind of look like the letter T, of course. And that's another way that they're described. They look like the letter T. Uh, now, again, whether or not they have a short stalk or not, uh, these are still two branched hairs. Uh, here's a diagram of, or again, a photo micrograph, I should say, of what they look like, because when you're gonna look at these, you're gonna be looking at them from the top down. Looking at them from the top down, you're using a microscope or a hand lens, looking at the top of these hairs, they're gonna look like this. You can kind of see that you know, uh, you, you can see kind of right here, this is the widest part. So they, they look, you're, you're just seeing this top part, of course, because especially if it's sessile, there is, there is no um, stalk to see really. If there is a stalk, maybe you know, there's enough of a stalk so the hair might be bent enough that you might be able to see the stalk. These look like to me that these are more of the type A there where there isn't much of a stalk. And so the, the, the top of the T is pretty much right at the leaf surface. So, but the main point here is that you just simply have to be able to decide whether or not it's got branched hairs, hairs like this, or whether the hairs are unbranched, whether they're simple, whether they're like this. Okay, are there any questions here? I'm going to uh, switch over to the handout that shows um, the table real quick. Again, if you haven't been to one of these before, I provide this table. Now again, for, for this workshop, again, we're, we're looking at a family, not just one genus, we're looking at a family. The other workshops, most of the other workshops were narrowed down to just one genus. Here we're looking at trying to focus just on the native Brassicaceae. So uh, we're not gonna have time to go through this in any great detail, of course, but I wanted to at least give you um, a list of the native Iowa genera in Brassicaceae, these that you see right here. And, and I have to apologize, uh, the handout you have, I forgot to put uh, teritis in there. So you're missing teritis. Uh, I added it to my copy here. But this should give you a pretty good sense of how to figure out what genus you have. Now, again, you can use a key, of course, um, most of the characteristics that are listed in through here for all of these genera are the very things that we've been talking about. Uh, so Arabis here, for example, um, mostly biennials, some short-lived perennials. The fruits are salics. In fact, they're, they are more than three times longer than wide, which that's what makes them a salic. Now they are flattened parallel to the replum. So that's gonna be a good characteristic, flattened parallel to the replum. 
There's not too many of the mustards are that way. The seeds are in one row. And another good characteristic, the pedicels and the sleeks are really tightly oppressed, which means that they are vertical, erect, and pressed down against the stem that they're attached to. Uh, so here's the stem, here's the uh, fruit, the, the pedicel and the fruit, they are oppressed or, or flattened down against that, that stem. You see the upper stem leaves here are auriculate and clasping. There are some branch tears present. So again, mainly on the lower portion of the plant and the corollas, the petals are either white, pink or purple. So again, I don't, we don't have time to go through all of these, but, but these are, each one of these genera can be distinguished from the other genera in this list. If you look through these descriptions and see what it is about that genus that's different from the rest. So we've got not 12, but 13 genera that are then native to Iowa. Then here's the reference table that I, I pulled together, which is um, got these five columns. There has been quite a bit of um, change in nomenclature in the Brassicaceae. So there's a Rosa here, which is you know what we have to work with for Iowa, our checklist in Iowa. Uh, quite a few species are going to be having a different name in the flora of North America. So uh, what we'll see in just a little bit is um, Arabis, which there was quite a few Arabis species in Iowa. Now Arabis is either one of four different genera, either Bocara, Teritis, there's one Arabis that still is Arabis, or Arabidopsis. So this column here, again, the first one is the nomenclature according to flora of North America, which is what we should be using now. Uh, because others in Rosa is out of date. The other information here tells you uh, its status. Well, of course, these are all going to be native, but there are a few special concern species in this group. You'll see uh, when it is a special concern or a threatened or endangered species, I provide some information about how many observations there are for that species, what's the most recent one. This one, as you can see uh, in the map over here for, from Bonap, there is no indication that this species is in Iowa, but yet we have records uh, in Iowa. This is from the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory Database. Uh, so that's why it's under review. Uh, this is again, speaks to somewhat of the difficulty in some of these uh, genera and species in terms of uh, identifying them. So again, um, the, this will provide some information about habitat. This one will provide a dot map of Iowa showing the distribution as far as we know in Iowa. Sometimes, um, so Bonap didn't have uh, Bocara canadensis. So I had to go to USDA plant database and pull up their map for the North America, or excuse me, for the United States. And then I just used this. This is the only thing I could find then that provided any information about the distribution in Iowa. The shading here uh, tells you right here, the green are forest species in general, the yellow are more grassland type species, the blue are wetland type species, and I've used gray in some of these cases. These are species that really have quite variable habitat and you can't not easily classify it as, as one of those three. So here's the uh, list of all of the species of mustard native, according to others in Rosa, native to Iowa. Um, now, there's, it's missing one species, actually. Uh, as we go down this list, scroll down, um, there is another Roripa, uh, some research I've been doing in Story County uh, over the last several years, um, I've turned up uh, Roripa curvipes, which is, uh, wasn't listed in others in Rosa. Uh, I don't have it in here because that's, that we just found that this, this uh, past uh, year or so. So I didn't bother putting it in, but there is one more. And whether it's native or not is, is a big question. Uh, it probably isn't native. So in that regard, it wouldn't belong in this table because this table is mainly is, is supposed to be just the native species. So again, here's another one that changed uh, what was Amaracea aquatica is now Ripper aquatica. This one is a special concern species, as you can see. Uh, 
The ones that are shaded are also the ones that I'm going to, we're going to talk about uh, real quick now um, that are going to be in the pictorial key that's coming up in just a little bit. Because these are the ones that are the most common. These are the ones that you're most likely you're going to run into. Uh, and so these are the ones that I'm going to you know, help you uh, take a look at. Uh, the Iowa coefficients of conservatism, if you haven't been to one of these uh, before, this is just a number from one to 10 that uh, provides a um, measure of how conservative the plant is. I'm going to be talking a lot about this in two weeks. The last workshop is going to really focus on, on plant conservatism, what it really means, how we figure it out, how it can be used to evaluate habitats and ecosystems to get a sense of the conservation value that a piece of land might have. We've got five Cardamine species uh, in Iowa. All of them are native. Bobosa is a pretty common one. You're gonna find that in sedge meadows and wet places. The glassy eye is mostly a Southeastern Iowa species. I've not seen that one myself. Uh, Parviflora, Pennsylvanica are kind of two species that are fairly weedy. Um, see them a lot in seed bank studies that I've, I've done. And then Cardamine concatenata, that of course is two fort. That's the spring ephemeral that we will be seeing soon coming up in our woodlands. We've got one native uh, Descarania, uh, tansy mustard, another species that's, when you have a low coefficient of conservatism like two, that tells you that that's a fairly uh, rural, early successional type of species, more of a, a weedy type species. We've got one Draba that's um, native. Draba are pretty distinctive. We'll see some pictures of them. Iodanthus, that's the purple rocket. That's the floodplain forest species. Um, this one, uh, you know, I'm not gonna cover this one because it's a special concern species. And again, it's really a great plain species. There are a couple observations <laughs> in uh, supposedly. Um, the last one though, way long, almost hundred years ago, it hasn't been seen since. So. I doubt that it's still present in Iowa. A couple of lepidiums or pepper grasses that are native. They occur everywhere pretty much. And then Roripa, the marsh cress or yellow cress here. There's two, uh, four species that are native. Again, I said there's another Roripa curvipes that I'm not sure whether it's native or not, but these two are the more um, common of, of the species of, of, of Roripa, especially this one right here, Palustris. That's one that you'll definitely see if you're in any wet, wet areas. All right, then I quickly just, uh, here's a list of all of the non-native uh, genera and the number of species in that genus. So again, non-native species vastly outnumber native species. And uh, this just again tells you what the fields are in this table and some references there. All right, uh, I won't go through the glossary. You've got a glossary that helps you with terminology. Let's get back to the uh, PowerPoint here and take a look at the pictorial part of the key here, which, yeah, hopefully will be very helpful as you try to, again, sort these out and um, maybe figure out what species you've got. So the first page here is gonna separate all of those that were formerly Arabis and now fall into one of these four genera. And Bo Bocara is really one of the most difficult genera, uh, is a difficult genus in the, in the mustards. In most of the keys, it will key out three or four different places. So it's really hard to characterize that thing. But what works the best generally to separate these four into two groups is whether or not those uh, pedicels and fruits are oppressed down to the stem or not. Most of Bocara and uh, Arabidopsis do not have that those fruits are pressed. The fruits are more uh, spreading. They're even uh, sometimes um, uh, recurved and, and sort of lax, drooping. They're not standing upright and pressed up against the stem, except for Bocara stricta. And there's, there's no easy way to deal with this except just say, that's the exception here. So Bocara and Arabidopsis then can be separated on the width of the fruits here, as you can see. Um, basically more than 1.5 Bocara, less than 1.5 uh, 1 Arabidopsis. 
So sand crest is Arabidopsis. We can see um, also the upper stem leaves. There's some differences there. The upper stem leaves and sand crest are really linear. You can see them right through here. Uh, this is um, here's um, hairy rock crest. So Arabis right here. And so the other, the other, the other uh, group there, and again, again, Arabis and Arabidopsis, these are the ones that have the pedicels are pressed to the stem. Like you see right here, see how these are the fruits. These are the fruits and, and the pedicels. They're almost, you know, standing almost straight erect. And so they're really um, more or less a press down against that, that stem. Uh, I'm going to deal with these two because there's only uh, one that we have to deal with in each of these cases. So, um, Arabis here, rock, hairy rock press, and tower mustard. Here again are those fruits. See how erect they are, how upright they are. Even in uh, teritis here, teritis glabra, the, the um, leaves are somewhat erect too. See how erect these leaves are in through here? Uh, this is one of the plants that has probably the least amount of pubescence in the mustards, uh, hence the name teritis glabra tower mustard. All right, so that should help you um, separate out just the, there's three species represented in these three genera here, Tritus, Arabis, and Arabidopsis, three common species. So those three come out right here. And then Bokera is going to be on the next page. Um, so we're going to have to separate Bokera into two groups here. Those that do not have clasping leaves at the base, that's going to be Cyclopod. Uh, this is a uh, Bocara canadensis. This is a fairly common one. This is one that you'd like to see. See how these fruits here are recurving downward. Uh, they're almost drooping. So you can see that through here as well. And this is a common way you're gonna find mustards again. You're gonna find mustards along the lower portion of the inflorescence is gonna have fruits. May be, you know, again, fairly, fairly mature fruits. And the upper part may still have some flowers yet. So it is, it is nice in that you can often use uh, both flowers and, and fruits. The other uh, two, Bocaras, then are going to be uh, species that do have those clasping leaf bases, sagittate bases, Drummond's rock cress, which is right here, and tooth rock cress, which is right here. And again, we're gonna see that those are going to be separated um, well, the uh, Bocara stricta, which uh, is uh, Drummond's rock crest right here, that's, the, that's that one that has that exception. So its, it's sleeks are somewhat oppressed, as we can see right here. Its sleeks are somewhat oppressed, uh, standing straight up erect and oppressed near the stem. Whereas over here in tooth rock crests, again, its leaks and pedicels are spreading or more divaricate. Here's the, its fruits right here, spreading almost you know, straight out, going straight out. Those fruits are not pressed up against the stem. That's probably the best way to separate these two is the basis again on, on those fruits, whether they're strongly ascending and oppressed or not. Uh, there are some differences in the leaves that might be helpful too, but that was one of the more straightforward uh, ways of separating them. Here again, we can see the sagittate base here on this one. And we can see so that, that those oracles on that leaf as well. All right, let's move on to the pepper grasses, lepidium. There's two lepidiums that are native in Iowa. There's another one um, that's non-native, that's fairly common, uh, lepidium campestre, field pepper grass. Uh, these look a lot alike, and the keys are going to tell you that you might be able to distinguish them on the basis of this. The petals usually shorter or smaller than the sepals versus taller or longer than the sepals. Uh, there's some, some keys will say there's a difference in the shape of the silicles here. Uh, these silicos look pretty much darn they're the same as these to me uh, in terms of their shape. The thing that I use to separate these is I use always use this last characteristic here. You look at the inflorescence 
uh, stem, the inflorescence axis. So again, it's this, these branches or these, the upper part of stem in through here. Uh, and you look to see what kind of pubescence it has. This picture from Minnesota plants does a really good job of pointing this out. The, um, the one here on the left, again, Lepidium densiflorum, uh, as it says up here, um, has minute straight hairs. The other one, uh, Lepidium virginicum, Virginia pepper grass, has pubescence or hairs that are curved. And it takes a good hand lens to see this. But here you go, here's the straight hairs. There's, they're short and straight. They almost look like little um, papilla or little um, glands, so to speak, little, just little bumps. Uh, but here on virginicum, you can see these hairs are curved. They're short, but they're, they're definitely curved over. You can see that pretty easily. I usually um, collect these and bring them home, just collect the portion I need and look at them under the scope uh, so I can see really, see well uh, what the situation is. That's the best way to separate these two. All right, now we're gonna look at uh, cardamine. So cardamine, uh, there's five species. They're all laid out for you right here. Um, we're going to separate them into two groups first on the basis of their leaves, simple, entire, or sometimes maybe a little bit of uh, teeth, Serrate means that there's little teeth along the edge of the leaves uh, versus over here, these three species all have leaves that are somehow compound or deeply lobed. So compound or deeply lobed, pretty clear difference in the leaves here. So the, this two, these two species here are these right over here. So we're dealing with the first, these two right here. Um, so the two that have the simple, mainly entire to maybe slight teething, uh, spring crest, cardamine bulbosa, shown right here, and um, cardamine the glassy eye, purple crest, shown over here. And you can see, again, there's um, nice examples of the leaves here. These are clearly simple leaves. Uh, there's a little bit of slight uh, teething, maybe you might say here, some small teeth and some of these. Um, and some of these, the margins are mostly entire, but clearly um, simple leaves here. The uh, purple crest here, uh, the glassy eye, does tend to have sort of really light lavender flowers. It can have flowers that are a little bit, um, you know, some flowers are going to look a little bit more white probably. So um, sometimes that might be a little bit of confusion between these two if the flowers aren't quite as, as lavender looking as they should be. And even over here, sometimes spring crest can have a little bit of a slight purplish or pinkish tinge in some of the petals. Um, this is when you have to look at many and try to look at many individuals and try and get a sense from the population of, of what, what the situation is. Uh, you can also separate them, as you see here, by the stems. Um, spring crest is going to be pretty much glabrous, maybe some very sparse, my, tiny, tiny, minute little hairs, less about, about one tenth of a millimeter is what I mean by minute. Whereas the glass eye will have hairs that are a little more, stems are a little bit more hairy. Um, now this stem here doesn't look all that hairy and, and that's what it's trying to show there are some hairs there. Um, but if it does have hairs, then the hairs are more substantial than the hairs on spring crest. All right, so over here on the compound or lobed ones, we've got, this is tooth wart, and we'll take a look at it. That's a fairly uh, easy to recognize spring ephemeral. The other two are the two that are difficult to tell apart. Um, small flower, cardamine parviflora, small flower bittercress, and cardamine pencil, pencilvanica. The thing that works the best here, I think, for them is this one right here, the first one, the, uh, the lateral leaflets, kind of what their shape is, and especially the, the terminal one. So in this one, the, the lateral leaflets are really linear, very narrow, not very wide, as you can see here. And the terminal leaflet is very similar to, uh, looks very similar to the lateral ones. In Pennsylvania, 
the lateral leaflets are broader. There's more width to them, mostly more than four millimeters wide. They're more oblance, later obovate, almost in some cases, almost circular. And again, the terminal leaflet is uh, different, usually different uh, from the lateral ones. Terminal, here it is, yeah, terminal is wider than the lateral. We'll see that on the next slide here. So here's two thwart. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time with this one. This one hopefully is one you've seen before. This is again, a fairly common spring ephemeral and nice upland forest. It's the only, it's, it's the only one in uh, this group that has world leaves. So again, most of the time mustards have, have alternate leaves. Uh, in most cases, almost you know, 95% of the time, probably alternate leaves. But um, the first set of leaves, or excuse me, the, the upper calling leaves, the, the lower basal leaves, we, we, we can't use those, those are basal leaves, but the calling leaves, there's usually, um, here we can see three leaves right here uh, uh, that are in a whorl. The other uh, two, again, Parviflora and Pennsylvanica. So here's the leaflets on small flower bitter crests. See how narrow they are? See how the terminal leaflet is pretty much very much similar to the lateral ones. Here is a leaf, compound leaf on Pennsylvanica. Broader, the terminal one is much broader than the lateral ones. And here's a whole bunch of them down here showing some variation. But again, it's still pretty consistent that the, uh, the leaflets are generally quite a bit broader. Even the, the uh, lateral ones are broader. Uh, the knees over here, and again, the terminal one being somewhat different and broader than the lateral ones. So uh, yeah, these, these, these two cardamines are probably the most difficult to separate. So here's three species that are very uh, distinct kind of in their own way. There's only one species that's native in each of these genera, Discarinia, tansy mustard. Uh, the thing that I would say there is it's got really compound leaves. Compound leaves and leaves that are also compound and deeply lobed at the same time. So you, a good way of describing that kind of situation probably, again, in sort of non-technical terms, is that the leaves are sort of fern-like. If you see someone say kind of fern-like leaves, that means generally that the leaves are at least once or twice compound and maybe they are also uh, quite a bit of um, lobes as well. It's also going to always have yellow flowers. Uh, then the next one that's very distinct is Whitlow grass, Drava, uh, Drava reptans. And it's really distinct because this is, this is a tiny little plant. Uh, it's going to be found in really sterile, low fertility, sandy, rocky types of environments. It, it can have um, calling leaves, but most of the time you just see this uh, basal leaves, and then you see a, a, a leafless stem leading up to the flowers here and then the fruits. Uh, this does show that it can have some leaves on the, on the stem. So these, these are some calling leaves here that are along the stem. But look at another characteristic, look at all the hairs. Uh, very, very hirsute. I think there's going to be some branched hairs in here and probably some stellate hairs as well. It's a very distinctive little, little plant. And then the other one is Iodanthus, uh, the purple rocket. Um, this one is pretty distinct too in terms of the, the leaves. It's got uh, oracles at the base of the leaves down here. It's got these really broad, um, somewhat sort of non-mustard-like leaves. Um, a little bit more like the leaves on Dame's Rocket, I suppose you might say, because uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the mustards have have leaves that are at least uh, lobed to some extent, and these are not. Then it has sort of a, a lavender flower. The only thing often about the flowers that helps really much is just the color. Uh, most keys do not do anything much else at all with the with the flowers except just looking at what the uh, color of the corolla is. Because when you look at the sepals and the size of petals and other things, um, sometimes the stamens do enter the picture. As I said, some of some of these species, like like uh, the lepidiums, as I said, will just have two stamens. 
Um, so sometimes the number of stamens is used, but for the most part, the flowers aren't used that much. Okay, now we're on our last one here, uh, Roripa. And so again, there's two species of native ro of uh, Roripa that are fairly common and you could run across. So what I've done here is, and I did this with the, uh, let me back up real quick. I did this also with uh, Lepidiums. I, I forgot to mention this. These characteristics here are the are characteristics that help separate the native Lepidiums from the non-native ones. So these characteristics right here help to separate the native Lepidiums from the non-native ones. So these characteristics, these are also characteristics for these two species. And likewise then, these characteristics here are species again help to separate the Roripas from the other Roripas that I'm not dealing with here. And what it boils down to here is that these two Roripas have really small petals or they don't really have petals at all. The petals are not even present. Um, that's gonna be stalkless yellow crests or if they do have petals, they're really fairly short, relatively speaking. The other Roripas have petals that are greater than 3.5 millimeters long. So that puts, uh, again, these two species in this, in this group here, and we can separate them on the basis of those petals, basically. So Roripa palustris, marsh crest, does have petals present. They're gonna be pretty small. Uh, sometimes they may be somewhat concealed by the sepals, uh, so not real conspicuous, but they're there if you look for them. Uh, more conspicuous is the length of the pedicels, the flower stalks. Uh, over here for Roripa sessiliflora, the stalkless yellow crest. Again, petals are basically absent. You will see here that it can have, and it does often have um, sepals that are somewhat colored. So you have to make sure you're not getting fooled by that. Uh, remember, if, um, the sepals generally in the mustards are, are pretty, usually green, like sepals are usually supposed to be, but because uh, this plant does not have any petals, the sepals have a tendency to be a little bit yellowish. So sort of taking on the role of what petals have. Uh, but you, the way you always you know, can distinguish that is that you know, if, if there's only one set of what look like sepals or petals, it's just one set of those. If there's just four of them, you don't, you don't see eight. You know, again, over here, you're gonna see four sepals and four petals, a total of eight. Over here, you're gonna see just four sepals. You, have to, you can distinguish them by the, by the number. Uh, another thing you can see here that separates them is the number of seeds uh, in each locule. Way more seeds in each locule over here. And again, that's, that will be something you can see again with ripe fruits. You can, you can uh, open up these fruits carefully. And I, I, I did it by looking at the number of seeds in each locule. Sometimes the keys tell you the number of seeds in each fruit, or the number of seeds in each fruit is just twice this number. Because again, each fruit has two locules. I find it more easy to think about the number of seeds per locule because that's what you're going to be looking at. You're going to open up a fruit on one side and you're going to be looking at the number of seeds that you see in that locule. And so um, I prefer to think about it that way rather than the number of seeds per, per fruit. All right, that is it. Um, that's the mustards, uh, crash course in mustards. Are there any questions? Uh, right now, the only question is, what's the evolutionary benefit to having reduced petals? Oh, huh. evolutionary advantage to having reduced petals. Well, there's less uh, biomass, I guess, that goes into them, certainly. Not a whole lot. Um, it's something that we tend to see um, for example, in the buttercups and Aronculaceae, quite a few species there uh, don't have true petals. They just have, have sepals. In many of those cases, as I said, when that happens, often the sepals become petaloid. Petaloid means petal-like, uh, and they take on the function 
Um, I think it's a matter of sort of just the evolutionary pathway that the plant has, has you know, allowed it to arrive at the point that we're seeing it more or less. Um, I mean, the only thing that I can think of is that if you don't really need petals because you're not trying to attract insect pollinators that much, that's not the case for, for mustards. Um, by and large, these are all insect pollinated. Uh, but again, if, if you think about what the role of petals is, it is to help attract pollinators and to provide visual uh, cues to, uh, to where the flower is and where the center of the flower is. So it can guide insects into where the nectar would be and also to where the pollen and stigmas are. So again, when you see that petals become non-essential, non-important, I mean, that's really wind pollinated flowers where petals are completely gone. And these that are insect pollinated, um, again, I think it's, there's still a need for petals. And again, through some kind of just evolutionary pathway, for some reason, the, the petals got lost or they got reduced. Uh, I can't say for sure. You know, that's something that happened in, in the distant past. Anything else? That's the only one we got in the chat right now. Well, that makes it easy. So Tom, I've, I've got a little bit more of a follow-up to my question. That was mine, by the way. Oh, um, okay. So do you think that there's something else that's drawing the um, insects to these plants that have a reduced um, petiole, or um, I'm sorry, reduced petal? Um, petals? Well, there could always be scent. Uh, scent is a very important uh, ways of uh, attracting um, pollinators. In fact, scents, a scent is usually more important, uh, a chemical approach to drawing attention to themselves and, and putting the word out to pollinators is usually more effective, at least over longer ranges. Um, so they use, you use some type of scent uh, to, again, um, pull insects in from a longer distance. Because again, they're, they're gonna be able to sense that before they can see what those petals look like. So, so that's usually um, more useful, uh, again, in pulling an insect close. Then it's usually the flower morphology, the characteristics of flower shape, the corolla colors, uh, corolla shapes, and all those sorts of things, the, the more uh, visual, aspects of the flower that are sort of secondary then in helping to um, again, attract the right pollinator, certainly, and again, help the pollinator find uh, where it needs to go. So I, I don't know much about, I, haven't, I didn't take much time to try to read about um, scents in mustards. Of course, mustards are, are um, they do produce quite a few chemicals. Uh, I don't know for sure how many of those are chemical scents, of course. There's a lot of chemicals that are produced for um, protection, quantitative uh, protection from herbivores. Uh, they produce a lot of, um, quite a few um, oils or those types of chemicals, of course, that um, rapeseed, of course, uh, the, the canola plant is an example of that. Um, so I imagine they're, they're pretty effective at producing, like most plants are pretty effective at producing a variety of chemical compounds. I can't say that I've ever really tried to smell a mustard to see uh, what kind of scent it has. And, and that may not even work as again, what we smell, it could be totally different than what an insect is able to detect. So, um, but it, it's one of those questions that, yeah, um, it's an evolutionary, it's, it's, it's someone, something wrapped up in the evolution of the plants. And, and of course that's hard to figure out. Thank you, appreciate it. You're welcome, thanks for the question. The one more, um, any comments on the presence of high numbers of species of non-native mustards in Iowa? Yeah, that is a good question. Well, when you go back and look at that table, it is uh, somewhat distressing. Um, well, because mustards are primarily ruderal species, undoubtedly, because that's just the way most mustards make their life, uh, they've, they've adapted to being very good at being an early successional species of being able to disperse seeds. Mustards disperse seeds uh, a number of different ways. I mean, they have these capsules that open up. Some of them actually have explosive um, siliques or silicles. 
that uh, it sort of provide an explosive mechanism to help uh, push and scatter the seed out. Cardamines are that way. Uh, another uh, special feature of mustard to seed dispersal is um, mucilaginous seeds. So a mucilaginous seed means that what happens there is the seed coat, when it gets a little bit damp, it produces some mucilage, you know, sort of this sticky, um, um, thick, viscous kind of substance, and that it makes it sticky. So it, it helps it to uh, stick to other things that then help it to disperse. One of the main ways that small seeds disperse is by sticking to our shoes, sticking to the foot of an animal, um, you know, sticking to the beak of a bird, sticking to whatever's gonna carry them and eventually drop them off. And so that, that mucilage is another way of increasing that stickiness to actually disperse that seed. So they're very good at dispersing is the point here and being good at dispersal uh, means and, and probably also being good at um, being a winter annual, again, producing those seeds early in the growing season, they can get to disturbances pretty well. And again, are good at colonizing those. So that makes it um, a, a family that's ripe for also being somewhat invasive and, and getting places where they're not, you know, where they're not really native in a sense getting dispersed beyond their native range. I mean, when you look at it, you'd have to do an analysis of each one of these in a sense and try to figure out well, how did that species get to this country, I guess, or how did it get to our state? But just being good at dispersing is going to help them. And, and then the fact that we have a lot of very disturbed landscapes, think of all the agricultural land. I mean, that's probably where most of these have, have really been successful is that they're successful in invading and colonizing uh, crop fields, hay fields, uh, corn fields. Uh, that disturbance that that, that disturbance in spring, uh, again, when those seeds uh, are being dis dispersed um, early summer, uh, again, a kind of a, a ripe type of environment, I guess you might say for, for again, that type of, of species with that life history. I have to say most of them, if you look at that list again, uh, it's on the, at the bottom of that table. There's a lot of, no doubt there's a lot of genera and a lot of species represented there, but most of them are not that invasive. You don't really see them becoming a problem. Allelaria, Petiolata, garlic mustard of course is an exception. Uh, Alyssum somewhat, Barbaria, Yellow Rocket, yeah, not really very much. Uh, Bruderoa, somewhat. Brassica, somewhat is, and Cisimbrium, somewhat are. So there are, you know, there are some in there that are somewhat uh, invasive or could become problematic. But uh, in general, I'd say the majority of them do not. So they're kind of benign. Tom, can I ask you uh, how many species? are you aware of that have the fruit suppressed to the stem, including the um, non-native species? Are there a lot of them? Or well, you if you're looking at the non-native ones, um, they would add a few more. Uh, the, again, the, so the genus Teritis, I think it's just one native species though for us there. The um, genus Arabis, those are all native. Um, Barbaria, somewhat has uh, oppressed fruits and pedicels, Barbaria. That's, that's a non-native one, of course, Barbaria vulgaris. Uh, uh, excuse me, not Descarina, but Cisimbrium, some of the Cisimbriums. So sometimes it's, again, it's not necessarily a genus characteristic, like in Bocaria. Bocaria, um, most of them do not have that, but Bocara stricta does. So again, unfortunately, that's not a characteristic that helps to separate out a specific genus. It can, it can be either way within some of the genera. The cisimbriums will have that. One of, one of the, there's three non-native cisimbriums, the, the tumble mustards. I can't remember sure which one it is, but one of them will have those, those uh, inflorescences or those fruits oppressed. It's a very, very distinctive characteristic. So it's very helpful, um, certainly, but 
there, and I'm sure there's probably some more in there. Some of the arisums, uh, arisums, I think maybe do some of the wallflowers. I just can't tell you for sure. It's usually always the ones that have uh, the salix though. Okay. The, those that have salix have the longer, uh, salix have the longer fruits. Those are the ones that then also may or may not, but you no, know, if they are oppressed, they are, they have those longer fruits, salix. If I, if I may continue with Sicimbrium, um, I, I think I, I've argued with people about what, the, <laughs> what things are. And uh, I, I think they are somehow the chia fin, Sicimbrium. Probably. Uh, possibly uh, one species that has the oppressed um, uh, fruit. Uh, but mm -hmm. what I wanted to ask you about Sicimbrium is, I took some seeds from one of the cymbriums uh, out of Chia Fen and I grew it in my garden. And the ones that the cymbrium were maybe uh, a little high, not quite waist high, I would say. But the ones I grew in my garden were six feet high. I don't know <laughs> if they came from those seeds or not, but but I thought I did. I thought I planted them and I thought that's where they came from. <laughs> Well, yeah, and, and so that's another good characteristic of, of these uh, sort of early successional species, rural species, uh, our selected species in the plant world is that they, when we say rural, what we mean by that is that they, they really like disturbed, rich soil, high fertility, um, you know, Iowa, good black earth kinds of soil, but they, but they need to have it disturbed. They, they can't, they're not good competitors. They can't compete against perennials. So uh, they need to have, you know, have that disturbance. Um, and, and so, yeah, you'll see them growing. Uh, I've, I saw some brassicas on this project last summer over in Eastern Iowa. It was, a, it was an, old, an old abandoned crop field. So, you know, good soil. Some brassicas that were, you know, eight feet tall too, just huge plants. Farmers grow mustards in their in their soil a lot of times. Which species do they seem to prefer? Oh, for a cover crop? Yes. Yeah, does anybody else know what that is? Um, what, I'm not sure what species. Black mustard, I don't know what that is, but. Oh, black mustard? It might be a brassica. I don't know what it is. Um, I, I don't know for sure which species it would be. Those are usually an annuals, those cover crop species, I think, so. I wonder if they might escape. Oh yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And that's again, probably where many of these non-natives have come from. I think probably have sort of an agricultural pathway, probably that's how they've, they've, they've gotten here. The one I'm most familiar with is radishes, but I've never known them to escape. Yeah, I don't think they, yeah, that's one that's a cover crop. Yeah, that's right. That's probably the one that they use. Um, Raffinus sativa, I think is the scientific name. Yeah. I've, not, I've never seen them escape into any place, you know, semi-natural. So that's good. I'm looking at the uh, Sisimbriums real quick here. And it's a Sisimbrium officinality. Uh, Sisimbrium officinale, I should say. Sisimbrium officinale has the uh, fruiting pedicels and fruits oppressed to the stem. Ah. So one of them does, the other two don't. That might be what I'm seeing out there. Yep, probably. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, again, thanks everybody. And uh, hopefully you can join in two weeks from tonight. It's gonna be a little bit different. Um, not going to be identifying plants, but I think you'll find it interesting to think about conservatism in the plant world, kind of the, uh, the, the reason it does, I think, make some sense at least to utilize it as a way to judge the character and conservation value of ha ha habitats. I'm going to show you how I do inventories and take that information and apply that information to doing a conservation assessment for the ecosystems that I find. And um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about what that means and all the different ways you can use that to have a better understanding of, of what you've got and maybe what kind of management directions you might have. So it's a little bit more tailored to um, management, of course, either uh, privately owned management or publicly owned management, whatever realm you might be in. But yeah, I think you might find it interesting. And that's the last one. Yep.
Well, thanks, Tom, and thanks, everyone, for joining, and hope you can join us in two weeks. Yep. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Lance. See you. Bye. Good night. See you in two weeks. <laughs>